So today we are going to discuss uh, classical mechanics. Okay, Newton's law describes the motion of macroscopic objects. Now, before we get into the details of Newton's law and all the sort of technical bits, let us pause for a second and focus on how we actually describe a macroscopic object as far as we are concerned in this lecture. Okay? So in our simplified world, a macroscopic object will be identified with a point-like particle, which is described by its position in space. Okay? So the state of our system is simply given by a three-dimensional vector, which we're going to call x. Now, as the particle moves, evolves in time, this vector x will sweep some trajectory, and that is the motion that we want to describe through Newton's equations. So, as the position varies in time, we can define the velocity of the system, which is the rate at which the position is changing as a function of time. This is sometimes denoted as x dot. And we can also look at the rate at which the velocity is changing as a function of time. And this is what we usually call the acceleration, or uh, x double dot. Okay. Now, in this framework, Newton's law is a mathematical equation which relates the state of the system to the dynamical forces that are acting on it. Okay? And the equation is extremely simple. It, tells, it says that F is equal to MA, where A is the acceleration that we just uh, defined. F is the total of all the forces acting on your system, and m is the mass of your system. Okay. So this is a differential equation. Okay. It involves the derivatives of the position vector that you can solve, and which gives you the position of your system as a function of time for all possible times. Okay. So this is an equation that relates the state of your system, or the rate at which the state of your system is changing, to the forces that are acting on it. So in this sense, this equation encodes the dynamics of the system. It tells you how the system is going to react to the forces that are acting on it. So we can now work out some simple consequences of Newton's law. So first of all, let us introduce a new quantity, which we call the momentum of our system, which is simply the product of the velocity of the system times its mass. Okay? Now, using the momentum, we can rewrite Newton's law in the following way. First of all, we substitute this expression here for a. Okay, so we can rewrite that the force is equal to the mass of the system multiplied by the first derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And then if you look at this expression here, under the assumption that the mass of the system is a constant, this is simply the first derivative of the momentum. So a simple way to rewrite Newton's law is to say that the total of the forces acting on the system gives you the rate at which the momentum of the system is changing. Okay. Now there is a very simple consequence of rewriting Newton's law in this form. Namely, if you take f to be equal to zero, so if your system is isolated, if there are no forces acting on your system, then the time derivative of the momentum has to be equal to zero, which is another way of saying that the momentum of the system is conserved. Okay? So in this very simple example, we've seen something which is actually extremely important and extremely useful in physics, which is a conservation law. Okay? We have shown, starting from first principles, from our dynamical equation, that under given conditions, namely that the forces acting on the system vanish, there is a quantity which is conserved. And we will see that this kind of conservation laws will appear over and over again 
in during the during the MOOC. So in order to move forward in our discussion of classical mechanics, we are now going to simplify our system. We're going to consider a one-dimensional system. So this is again a point particle which now moves along a one-dimensional line and therefore the state of the system is now described by a single real number which we're going to call x which changes as a, as a function of time. Okay. Now we're going to introduce a new concept which is the kinetic energy of this uh, system. The kinetic energy is the energy that is related to the motion of the particle. Okay? And in order to make this a little bit more sort of quantitative, we're going to write down an equation that gives you the value of the kinetic energy as a function of the state of the system. Okay? So the kinetic energy T is just one half times the mass times the velocity of your particle squared. Okay? So the faster the system moves, the more energy it has. And likewise, the heavier the system is, the more energy it, it has. Okay? Now, if you remember, we defined the momentum of the particle as m times v which allows you to rewrite the kinetic energy as p squared over 2m. And now we go back to conservation of momentum. If the forces acting on the system vanish, so if our system is isolated, then momentum is conserved, which means that the kinetic energy is also conserved. And again, this is a simple example of a very important principle, which is conservation of energy. Okay? So in this case, we uh, have discussed only the kinetic energy in a very special case. But this is actually a general principle, which you will see again and again in further lectures. So far we've been discussing conservation laws for systems that were isolated, so for systems on which there were no forces acting. Now we're going to take another step and we're actually going to see what happens when there is actually a non-vanishing force acting on uh, our system. Now in order to keep it simple, we will still be considering a one-dimensional system so there is only one coordinate x, so we don't need any vectors in this case. Okay? And we are going to consider a force which is actually constant as a function of time. So now your system is no longer isolated, there is a force acting on it, and this force is constant. Now, remember we said that the acceleration is the second derivative of the position of the system with respect to time. So we can rewrite Newton's law as a differential equation for x. Okay? And in this case, because f is a constant, this is a very simple equation that you can solve in a straightforward way and you can find immediately the velocity as a function of time and the position of the particle as a function of time. We are not going to solve the equation here, but you can do it uh, as an exercise and you will find extra material available if you need help in solving the differential equation. Okay? Now, the result will depend on the velocity at time zero, which we call v zero here, and the position at time zero, which we call x zero. So once these two quantities are known, you can then compute the velocity of the system and the position of the system for any value of the time Now, with some algebra, you can actually prove that this relation here holds. Okay? So the product of the force times the displacement in space, 
Okay, so this is the distance between the position of the particle at time t and the position of the particle at time zero is precisely equal to this quantity here on the right. Now, if you look at this equation for a second, you will immediately recognize that this is the difference of the kinetic energy at time t minus the kinetic energy at time zero. So the variation in the kinetic energy, which we call delta t here, is equal to this quantity here to the left, which is the product of the force times the displacement. Now this quantity here is called the work done by the force. Okay? So when, when there is a force acting on your system, as a consequence of uh, Newton's law, you can show that the variation in the kinetic energy is equal to the work done by the force. So, the variation of the kinetic energy is equal to the work done by the force as our system is displaced from x0 to x. And we saw a minute ago that the expression for this quantity here, w, is simply the product of the force, which is assumed to be constant in this case, times the displacement between x and x0. Okay? Now you see, because this quantity is equal to the variation of the kinetic energy, it has to be an energy as well. Okay? So we can introduce a new kind of energy, which we call the potential energy, such that the work done by the force is simply equal to minus the difference of the potential energy between x and x0. Okay? So you can check easily that if you define v of x to be equal to minus f times x, then this expression is simply the difference between the potential energy at x and the potential energy at x naught. Okay. And the force is simply the derivative minus the derivative of the potential energy with respect to x. Now, having defined the potential energy in this way, you see that the work done by the force is simply minus the variation of this uh, potential energy. And so if we define the total energy of the system to be T plus V, so the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, you see that the variation of the total energy, delta E, which is simply the variation of the kinetic energy plus the variation of the potential energy, is equal to zero, simply because we defined the variation of the potential energy to be the negative of the work done by the force, which is equal to the variation of the kinetic energy. So here we have another example of a conservation law, which is the conservation of the total energy of the system, which is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the uh, potential energy. Now we have derived this uh, relation in a simplified framework, but the conservation of energy and the definition of a potential energy are actually very generic concepts that appear in all sorts of uh, classical systems.